I don't have a workshop anymore. And in fact, what I have right now is a bench in a corner of my back room. My drill press is on the table next to my barbecue. And I have a brand new rifle that I'm going to build from the ground up as an F SK1517X, which means that everything is going to be done as quickly and as expediently as possible. Um, it's, uh, it's going to follow some of the principles that I developed with this uh, system, the, uh, the second iteration SK1517 fire control group. Um, that's the one of my original ones. Uh, completely destroyed by fire. All the springs are completely burned out. This is uh, this is what's left of the um, of the SK17 uh, fire control group that used AR15 parts. It was in a, uh, a plastic Tapco stock, and that that is a solid lump of badly burned nylon. But, uh, I managed to save my uh, my template drawing for my SK1517 um, builds from the uh, the wreckage of my workshop. So for this build, I'm going to be walking you through the steps of how to turn an SKS into an SK1517X. It'll have all the features of an SK1517, but with the uh, individual parts being made in as expedient a manner as possible in my very tiny um, home workshop. So your first step is going to be removing the fire control group, cutting off the trigger guard. So we're going to cut off the trigger guard now, and typically with these builds I would uh, make it pretty pretty nice, it'd be pretty clean. Um, this time around it's going to be a lot less clean, but uh, still perfectly functional, as we will see. So there's the trigger guard cut off, and uh, you see you want to leave a lot of meat around your uh, safety pin, because that's pretty important. Um, but right now you're just you're cutting everything off with everything still in place um, if you want to do it as quickly and expediently as I do and a an angle grinder with a thin metal cutoff wheel is your best friend because although cutoff wheels on Dremels do a much cleaner and more precise job um, if you are handy with a, a cutoff wheel and an angle grinder they cut through the stuff you want to cut a whole lot faster than in your Dremel wheel, and Dremel wheels are expensive. You, I pretty much save them for really fine work or stuff that's harder to do with the cutoff wheel because um, of how much they cost and of how quickly they wear down. So anyway, uh, the next step is to remove the safety lever. With the safety lever removed, the next thing to do is to take a piece of wire and you have to bend it into a kind of a double L shape. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and weld it together and then reinstall it. So I'll get that uh, fitted and stuck in and I'll show you how that works. This is what the safety lever looks like when it's done. The piece of wire is welded in and you can see how now it's going to sit in the fire control group right where it originally did, but it's going to stick out to the side. So this is the reinstalled SK1517X safety lever. So there's your, there's your safe, and there's your fire. Now we're going to get to work actually on the trigger, um, the extended trigger. So. We're going to need our um, template for that, and we'll, uh, we'll figure out where we want it to sit. So this is the template for the tricker that I'm going to be cutting out, and it's basically just going to get cut out and folded. So here is the extended trigger assembly, which you will see how it gets attached to the trigger. So here we see the um, 
the extended trigger is now attached to the fire control group. It uses a 1 8 uh, split roll pin to secure it. Um, very commonly available from hardware stores. Um, and it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's drilled through the fire control group body um, right down at the bottom of the uh, fire control group pocket where none of the parts actually touch it during operation. So running a pin right through there is fine. And, um, but it, it, it can't be any farther forward or it will interfere with the semi-automatic function. Um, so it does have to be a ways back. So we are using the full thickness of the three quarter inch um, steel tubing to, uh, to run forward to the trigger face, which is, as you can see kind of where it's, where it's lined up compared to my um, ideal fire control group. On to the next part, which is, uh, oh yeah, cutting out and forming and welding the pistol grip frame. Okay, so there's the pistol grip frame all marked out and I'm just gonna get it cut out with my angle grinder, clean it up a little bit, fold it into shape and make sure that it uh, fits and functions around our trigger group and safety. So this is basically what the grip frame will look like once it's mocked up around the um, the fire control group. You can see I've got this this little uh, leg right here that provides stability to it because otherwise it would just kind of be this shell around the outside. Um, and we'll have we'll have uh, essentially three weld points. We're gonna weld it here, and weld it here, and weld it up here on the nose. Um, there's some other administrative work to do before I uh, weld it though. So I'm gonna start doing this. So the next step I have, as you can see, you cut out the edge of this rail on the right hand side because that's the side that the bolt catch travels on um, and I've cut off already the um, the pin that holds the front of the fire control group into the receiver of the rifle and so that's going to get welded in place and it's going to stay there it's not going anywhere after this the other one on the other side um, traditionally with the SK 1517s I've um, just cut this pin out entirely, but what I've done this way is I've only cut it off on the one side and I've left it long And so I'm going to press it through um, Once I get everything welded up and and finished and that's what's going to hold the magazine catch Into the front of the fire control group because um, even though we're fabricating a new magazine catch with an AK style uh, paddle release lever um, we still need to have this uh, installed in the rifle because it uh, forms a secondary function of holding the front of the sear spring um, and giving you the proper sear tension. So it really has to stay where it is. But we're um, we're going to go ahead and clean off all of the stuff that we don't need because we won't really be using this for a magazine catch anymore. So that's the next step. And there is the uh, magazine catch all cleaned off, nice and nice and beautiful. We're going to go ahead and weld everything up now. Pistol grip has been welded on. Nice rough uh, brazed welds here. Quick, dirty, effective, particularly for uh, steel of this thinness. So, let's see, uh, we're on safe. You got fire. my kids playing in the backyard um, so the next step is actually to uh, to fit this to the stock and the reason is because there's a bunch of things that I have to do with the stock installed um, so anyway you see how the safety works so you've got put it on safe kind of got a nice little thumb thumb rest you know it's on safe because it's got this giant wire sticking to the side and it's up for fire down for safe, up for fire. Uh, and it's just, you're literally just welding a piece of wire on the side of your safety, so that's quick and expedient. Got a nice solid trigger there. Good, nice and, nice and responsive. Not, uh, not a massive improvement over the original because we wanted to make sure that uh, it was still working with the factory safety, but Anyway, everything's, everything moves freely and functions great, so we're gonna press on with the rest of the build. Let's show you what we're gonna do with the stock. 
So as far as modifying the stock goes, there's uh, a few basic things we're going to do. Obviously, this uh, or this bit of tubing is welded on. It's going to have to be the stock's going to have to be hogged out to make it wider, so that'll fit in. Um, we're going to have to we're going to have to clear out for the space for the trigger to move freely up inside the stock. Um, we're going to have to uh, cut back some air material so that it's easier to get your finger on the uh, bolt catch release. Um, cut a little bit of material back to make sure that the yeah. magazine catch housing can go all the way down. And also we're going to have to cut some material out for um, the, uh, the, the safety on the side. So that's kind of the, the main things we're doing there. Now, when it comes to uh, one eighth drive rotary tools, these these carbide burrs are fantastic for removing lots of material in a very short period of time. Which, like all other things rotary tool related, is their um, selling point and also their curse because it's really easy to overdo it. I like them a whole lot better than sanding drums. Um, they're great for removing a lot of material fast. So That's what we're going to be using on this stock to uh, clear out the material. We'll just do it up here quick. So here's the stock with all of the uh, the cutouts, and if you've watched any of my other videos, you've already seen like how most of them work. Um, but again, this is an expedient build, so we're not going to be doing any refinishing on it. We're just uh, we're just gonna probably hit it with some uh, air fan or th something to seal all the open spots. But uh, one thing that I have done is you can see it fires anyway time to uh, take a break from work and do the bolt mod so these carbide burrs are are great for removing a lot of metal so we're gonna start off taking most of the material off of this uh, the magazine rails on this uh, on this bolt with the carbide burr and then we'll switch over to a fine tool just at the end. So the rails are cut off. Um, basically flush. Believe it or not, it doesn't have to be perfect. So start with the large burr. Went to the uh, smaller burr. Uh, even it up with the um, flap disc on the angle grinder. And then uh, polished it with a steel wire brush. So that much is done. And we are moving on to um, setting up the stock for the magazine pin. So one of the main advantages of the SK1517 system is, of course, having detachable, um, closer to standard capacity magazines. So these are 20 round magazines, pinned to five for Canada, of course, although this is number five in my magazine stash. Um, but uh, once you've hogged a little bit of material out of your magazine well, so it's fit truly, what you're gonna wanna do is install a pin through the stock to accommodate the notch on the front of these duck billless magazines. These are Tapco, by the way. Rest in peace, Tapco. Hope you uh, feel better soon. So in order to, um, to accommodate uh, using these duck billless magazines that have a notch cut through the front face to um, hook onto the stock, what we have here is we've, uh, we've made a mark. We're gonna drill a hole through our stock. And when we've drilled the hole through our stock, we're going to run a pin through, and that's going to hook the front of our magazines. And uh, basically where you want this hole to be is uh, right on the, if you can see it, right on the leading edge of the um, inside of the magazine while opening in the receiver. Because you're just, you're just going to catch just the, uh, just the very edge of this magazine here with it. So you don't want it to be intruding too far um, 
So I'm gonna head over to the drill press and drill that hole and then we'll uh, we'll get that set up. So another one of the little things that I like to change to make my rifles a bit more to my own liking is um, I like to switch the sling swivel from its uh, location on the bottom keel of the stock where the Russians like to have it to the side of the stock where the um, Chinese stocks typically have it and the reason for this is I find it uh, it makes for a much more comfortable sling if you're gonna sling your your, uh, your rifle Israeli style which is what I I like to have a, like to have like a really a really long sling loop so that the uh, most of the action is kind of um, down by my hip line um, when it's slung diagonally across my across my shoulder hanging down my back out of the way it's easy enough to shorten it up shorten up this uh, magpul style sling if you if you want to have a shorter sling for something but um, the the rifle body doesn't twist if you have the sling swivel on the side of the of the stock nearly as badly so that's where I like to sling it uh, so one of the things I did for this build is I moved the sling swivel um, again one of those optional things I just did for my own personal benefit another day another part of the project I'm epoxying a uh, wedge of wood on the back end of this grip to make the grip possible to be contoured into something that's actually comfortable in the hand. Going forward with this uh, style of grip, which um, has a number of things that commend it, um, I'm going to try to uh, make the shape proper the first time around. But for this one, we're going to be, uh, we're just gonna be adding a, a back strap of wood before we put side scales of the grip on so that grip has a has a good contour and we'll see how that how that turns out when we're all done so there's the uh the, the back strap now epoxied and you can see the you can see the line that i should have been going for my problem really was just that i i made the bottom part of this grip frame too short and so that's what gave it that weird you know wedge profile instead of being something more comfortable. So now I've got the, the shape the way I want it. I've got these grip scales uh, cut out and they're gonna they're gonna sit just about like that. Same thing, get epoxy in place. Nothing too fancy, nothing too difficult. Um, permanent but you know this is my own personal rifle and Again, it's going with the expedient nature of the build that this is going to be just something uh, as, as quick and easy as possible to make an SKS into something that's um, more effective and more of a force multiplier. I'll get these um, epoxied on and uh, contoured um, and move on to the next step. Here's the fire control group with the pistol grip scale epoxy in place and sanded down. Um, use this 40 grit flap wheel disc on the angle grinder to get the contouring and shaping done. So now it fits very nicely in my hand um, and it took all of about three minutes to get it sanded down to the shape that I wanted because of the very aggressive grit on the flap wheel. So again, we're trying to do something quickly and uh, efficiently. The next step here, what, we're, what I've, I've done is, and I, um, I started cutting before I remember to make this part of the video. What I've done is I've drawn out the, uh, the outline of the shape that I want on my tubing. So this is gonna be the bolt catch release. Basically these two rectangular wings in the back will get folded out to the sides. Um, the, uh, the overall shape is going to be bent and folded a bit to uh, be able to engage with the bolt release and we'll, we'll cover that in detail once we actually get into that work. This is the magazine release, you've got your, your two sides, this is where the pin's going to go and then you've got the uh, this long bit here that's going to get folded over and back to form the uh, 
the actual paddle of the magazine release and um, support the uh, the magazine release um, over travel stop and um, also support the uh, magazine release spring. So we have finished, finished fabricating the uh, the bolt catch uh, with the um, extension bar on it that will get engaged by the actual bolt catch release lever. Um, approximately 90% of the time that you spend fabricating this bolt catch release is going to be spent um, cleaning up your welds so that it fits back in but you can do this with hand tools you just have to take your time have sharp tools and be really really light touch with the Dremel um, man everybody hates on the Dremels but honestly uh, there's not a whole lot of difference between um, a Dremel and the tools that dentists use to clean teeth and remove plaque deposits so it's really all just about your touch have a light touch uh, go slow it's better to take off too little than too much but you can absolutely make um, perfectly functional parts um, with a handheld rotary tool so anyway this is the uh, this is that part here and we're going to move on to um, fitting the uh, the lever now to the fire control group and I'll show how that all fits together. So I finished fabricating the bolt catch release lever. Um, this little tab here is because the outer diameter of the half inch tubing I used to make this is smaller than the inside diameter of the three quarter inch tubing that the grip frame is made of. So that's what that little tab does. It just keeps it over to the one side so that it can engage with the uh, um, the bolt catch. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, install it, demonstrate the function. Just got a temporary pin in there, but uh, you can see how the, the notch on the lever engages with the um, the transfer bar coming down from the bolt catch and when you pull the bolt back you can set the bolt catch with the bolt catch release lever and even though I don't have a magazine catch on we're going to demonstrate bolt catch release function so now it's installed and it drops the bolt so that's all there and I'll get uh, I'll get the, the the contours of the catch cleaned up uh, probably tomorrow when the sun's up. I'm not bothering the neighbors with a bunch of grinding. So this is the rough fabrication of the magazine catch. You can see it's a piece of steel tubing that's been cut out. The catch tabs been folded over and bent back. Uh, this forms the uh, over travel stop that interacts with the bottom of the uh, magazine catch housing and so now I'm going to get it uh, installed and work on the function. One thing that needs to be taken into account is the um, there has to be uh, allowance made for the um, the bolt catch um, lever and armature um, on one side of the uh, the magazine catch lever, so uh, we'll be filing down that one side. So this is the magazine catch installed now. You see, it runs like that with the bolt hold open, locked open. Lock the magazines in and you can drop the bolt. It's hard to do one handed. Really, the magazine catch is one of the simpler uh, parts of this build. Alright, so the, uh, the final part of this expedient build is going to be the charging handle. So, this is the charging handle guide, and it's just formed out of a piece of uh, half inch steel tubing. We've got a flange in the front that's going to get 
um, bolted to the front gas rule. You've got two flanges in the back that are going to get bolted through the uh, the back for rule. Uh, cut a channel down the middle, which is where this, which is going to eventually get cut out into a charging handle, um, similar to the ones that I've shown this uh, uh, channel before. I'm not not doing anything different with the charging handle today whatsoever than the ones I've already built. Um, it's going to be quite simple and uh, very much like my usual ones, um, but just going to try to do it as quickly as possible, get that together and uh, slapped on the gun. All right, so I've got this uh, charging handle folded into shape, and once it gets welded, that's, uh, that's going to be surprisingly solid, and then it's just going to, we're going to fit it inside the, the channel, fix the channel to the um, uh, to the gas tube and set it up to impinge on the bolt carrier. This is a relatively quick and easy process, especially compared to the way I used to do it. So as part of the expedient SKS build, it's got a, a great precedent. All right, so I've got the charging handle fabricated and riveted to the gas tube assembly. So it's, you see it's got this slot cut out in it that it rides back and forth in. And uh, just uh, cut a slot down through the bottom where the charging handle is welded on itself. And that keeps it captive in the um, inside the charging handle guide. We've got the far end with a hook uh, ground into it to um, support the, the bolt carrier, which has a matching groove cut into the face of it that meets up with these together and I'll get that installed in the gun and we'll see how it goes together. All right so now we have the charging handle it's been installed on the rifle that's what it looks like from the, the top. Um, gas tube cover has been put back on it. That's how it works. You see it's it's not attached, it just impinges on the front of the bolt carrier. And with that, all of the major components of the SK1517 have been uh, fabricated and installed on the rifle. Now this isn't the end for this particular rifle. I plan to um, rework the rear sight leaf so that it is the base for a micro um, reflex sight like uh, what are typically seen on pistols. Um, plan to cut the barrel down, thread it for a compensator, push the front sight back uh, up the barrel to the gas block, but that's, uh, that's going to be all For this uh, for this video, because this is the the basic elements of the uh, SK1517 system, a lot of that other stuff, um, you know, optics mounting and um, deleting the bayonet and stuff like that. That's all kind of win window dressing, but this uh, should give you a um, bit of a better idea about how to do an SK1517 expedient build. Um, if you ever find yourself needing to have a high capability firearm and all you have is an SKS, and in this case, a little uh, 16 inch by two and a half foot uh, workbench, you can still uh, get the job done. So. Anyway, that's uh, that's gonna be all for this uh, this video. Uh, questions, obviously, leave them in the comments. And uh, uh, stay tuned. We'll do some uh, we'll do some shooting videos with uh, with this rifle, and also with one that hasn't made an appearance in the YouTube channel yet. But this uh, build that I've been doing, which is. Uh, uh, it's an, actually an SKSD um, 
that I fabricated in kind of an SK1517 style, except that uh, because it doesn't have a bolt hold open, it uses the charging handle to use the charging handle to hold the bolt open. Reload the rifle, you just close the bolt by dropping the charging handle down. All right, guys. So that's it for this uh, expedient SK-1517.